Greetings, and welcome to Taming the Wave. Over the next two and a half hours, we'll be exploring one of the most exciting pieces of personal computer software available, Nutex Lightwave 3D. Before we begin, though, let's take a moment to explore what's in the package. There are two diskettes labeled Disk 1 and Disk 2. These contain a number of items which we'll be using in the tutorials later in this tape. Also, you'll find useful items like preset color surfaces, a pair of wonderful new 3D fonts from Unili Graphics, and samples of textures from JEK Graphics Pro Fills. We've also included the Taming the Wave Handbook, which provides a handy resource for a number of different pieces of information you'll need every day. Now let me take a moment to tell you about myself. My name is David Hopkins, and I'm the founder of Mock Universe, a graphics production firm dedicated to 3D animation via Lightwave 3D. Over the years, our clients have included Texaco, Beatrice Foods, and Holiday Inn, among others. Prior to forming Mock Universe, I worked with Aegis Development, the pioneers of Amiga Desktop Video. During that time, I produced a number of important products, the most important of which were Videoscape 3D and Modeler 3D by Alan Hastings and Stuart Ferguson, respectively. As you may have guessed, those went on to become Lightwave and Modeler from NewTek. In 1991, I began a continuing series of articles for Avid Publications, Avid Magazine, called Lighten Up. In 92, that was followed by a column in Video Toaster User, the magazine's sister publication. That column is called Taming the Wave and is based on this tape, which was already in production. Enough about that. Let's get on into Lightwave, shall we? Throughout this video, I'm going to presume that you have a basic understanding of the operations involved with the video toaster. You should already know about clicking and dragging with the mouse. Also, you should understand the operation of a standard file requester. If you aren't familiar with these things, please refer to the video toaster manual for explanations. Before we get into the nuts and bolts of Lightwave, it is important that we understand the workings of three-dimensional space. If you were a whiz at geometry in school, this should be no problem at all for you. Even if you weren't, don't worry, it's really not all that complicated. The first thing to remember is that there are three cardinal directions of movement in a 3D environment. All of these directions are measured from a common center, or origin. Here, we'll mark our origin with a white ball. The first axis, X, is used to illustrate motion to the sides. Anything to the right of the origin is a movement in the positive X direction. Anything to the left, obviously, is negative x. The next axis, y, illustrates movement up or down. Anything above the origin is positive y. Positions below the origin are negative y. The last axis, z, defines movement in front of or behind the origin. An item that is behind the origin is positive z. One in front of the origin is negative z. Exact positions can be located by measuring the distances between the item and the origin along each axis. These are normally noted in the order x, y, and then z, and use the metric measurement system. Of course, there's more to three-dimensional motion than straight movement. There are also three different directions of rotation an item may take. These are easy to remember with the following references. Just imagine your head is the item you wish to rotate. First is heading. Heading is rotation around the y-axis. A simple way to remember how heading works is to turn your head. Turning your head from left to right or right to left is changing your heading. Next is pitch. Pitch is rotation around the x-axis. When you tilt your head forward and back, you are adjusting your pitch. Finally, bank is a rotation around the z-axis. Leaning your head to the right or left is an example of changing bank. All of the rotation values are expressed in degrees, with positive or negative numbers deciding the direction of rotation around each axis. Lightwave's options are broken up into a number of distinct groups, making it simple to work on your animation at any level you desire. These areas, or control panels, are reached by clicking the appropriate button from those lining the left side of Lightwave's main screen. Before we dive into the mechanics of producing your own animations, let's examine the options available to you. We'll advance through them in a logical order from the point of view of a newcomer to Lightwave, but certain options explained may relate to others which have not yet been explained. You may also notice that we are bypassing certain options in the course of explaining others. Rest assured, however, that all options will be explained throughout the course of this program. Let's begin with the object's control panel, since the objects are really the center point of any animation. 
Objects can come from any of a large number of sources into LightWave 3D, but they all have one thing in common. They are simple wireframe models. These objects could have been created using LightWave's Modeler or any other modeling system which can produce files in any of the following standard formats. LightWave 3D, Videoscape 3D, Sculpt 3D or 4D, AutoCAD DXF, 3D Studio, Swivel 3D Pro, and Wavefront. No one format is necessarily better than the others, but each provides a slightly different approach to model description. LightWave can load these object formats directly, but there are other formats which LightWave will not recognize. In cases such as those, a program is needed to act as an intermediary device to convert the file to a recognized format. An object is best thought of as an actor in your animated movie. It could be anything from a simple flat plane to a complex big rig truck and trailer, or anything else you can imagine. The upper right corner of the object's control panel is dominated by a window providing information on any currently loaded objects, which is known by the awkward name All Objects Status Window. It reveals the total number of objects, points, polygons, and detail polygons that are currently loaded. Beneath these readouts is LightWave's current capacity, showing the total number of polygons the program is capable of handling at the moment. The Clear All Objects button will cause LightWave to release any objects it currently has in memory. A verification window will appear to make sure that this is really what you want to do. If you give approval, any settings for appearance or movement of the objects will be lost as well if they have not been previously saved. As the name suggests, the Load Object button will allow you to specify a data file on your diskette or hard drive to be loaded into active memory. The types of objects loaded are limited to those recognized by LightWave as mentioned previously. Loading a file more than one time will not cause the newer load to overwrite the previous version in memory, but instead will append a number to the end of the name to differentiate it from any loaded previously. Once a file has been selected and the choice accepted, LightWave will import the file. The All Object Information box will change to reflect the additional object. Using Load from Scene, it is possible to borrow the objects from an animation scene file that has already been created. This is handy when you have set up a complete environment for an animation and don't wish to have to reconstruct it from scratch. Realize that any associated lights or camera settings which were involved in the previous scene are not loaded along with the objects. The Save All Objects button offers a simple and convenient way to save any changes you have made to all of the objects you have currently loaded. When this option is chosen and after the prompt is confirmed, the files will be written back over the versions which were loaded each object file ending up with the name it originally had. Understand that this method will effectively delete any surface settings that these objects had at the time they were loaded into LightWave by overwriting them. If you would prefer that LightWave not save the files using the same names, it is necessary to use the Save Object button, which is found below. The Change Capacity button allows you to adjust the number of polygons that LightWave is able to use, the highest value that LightWave 2.0 is able to handle at any time is 65,530 polygons. If, however, you know that your scene is going to require less than that, it is a good idea to reduce the capacity to just over the amount you do need. This will allow LightWave to release memory for other uses. The current object window lets the user choose a particular object to perform operations upon with options found in the rest of the panel. If more than one object is loaded, the arrows to the right of this window will step through them one at a time so that the desired object may be chosen. The Clear Object button will cause that object specified in the current object window to be removed from the scene. As always with options that may be harmful if hit by accident, a verification window will appear. Once an object's appearance has been changed, it must be resaved to have that appearance next time it is loaded. Save Object will bring up a file requester where the user can choose to save the object with its original name or specify a new one. Note the changes made to an object using the Size and Stretch options within the Scene Layout window are not saved with the object file. The only way to permanently change the size of an object is by using a 3D modeling package such as LightWave's Modeler. It's wise to place extensions relating to the type of file you are saving. In this case, use .lwob for LightWave Object. Immediately beneath the current object display is the current object information box. 
This reveals the total number of points and polygons contained by the objects specified in the current object display. Each object within Lightwave 3D is capable of having its own motion path, allowing it to move independently of or in relation to other objects in the scene. In a technique derived loosely from traditional cell animation, motion is defined by creating special position markers called keyframes. These are simply frames in which the user has, in essence, told Lightwave that the specified object is in exactly this position in this particular frame. Lightwave can then examine the change in position from one keyframe to the next and determine how the object would be required to move so as to reach that position. This technique is commonly known as tweening due to the fact that the computer is calculating the frames in between the two locations. All of these keyframes and tweens are known collectively as a motion path. It is possible to save and load these motion paths for use with objects other than that for which it was originally created. The Object Motion button provides access to the settings which define the current object's movement. If the motion is named, that name appears in the field to the right of this button. When Object Motion is clicked, a motion control panel is opened, which will be explained shortly. The Metamorph button allows an object to transform from one shape to up to 15 others, provided that the shapes all have the same number of points and polygons. When clicked, a sliding gadget appears, which the user may set to any percentage of transformation. A setting of 0% would mean that the object is still shaped entirely as it normally would be, while a setting of 100% would cause the object to be completely transformed. To illustrate many of the settings for each option, this array of cubes will be used throughout the video. To see the most dramatic difference, compare the upper left cube to the lower right cube. This animation shows the effects of metamorph. The upper left object is 10% metamorphed from its original shape to that in the lower right corner. The next is 20%, then 30%, and so on. Remember that you are not seeing 10 different objects, you are seeing only two. A button marked envelope is located in this window as well. When clicked, an envelope control panel appears where the transformation may be caused to occur over time within an animation. We'll be exploring this screen shortly. The Metamorph target window specifies the object that the current object will transform into. The arrows to the right of this field allow the user to step through those objects currently loaded until the desired one is specified. If no object is specified in the Metamorph target, the Metamorph setting above will have no effect. A Metamorph can only work properly if the various objects have exactly the same number of points as all the others. This is a complicated condition and requires great care in modeling objects for this use. In order to create a morph chain in which a single object changes into a number of different shapes, you would set the morph target for the first object to be the second, then the target for the second to be the third. Continue this process for up to 16 different morph targets. Remember, each object must have exactly the same number of points. Like Metamorph, clicking the Object Dissolve button produces a sliding gadget. This gadget allows you to set the solidity of the current object. A setting of 0% means that the object is completely solid, while a setting of 100% means that the object has vanished completely. The Envelope button appears here again, and we'll get into that in a moment. There is, however, one minor problem associated with the Dissolve option. It seems that when you try to use Dissolve to fade an object in or out, you often are able to see through what are normally solid surfaces. If the object has internal polygons, you'll be able to see them while the object is fading either way. This is usually not the desired result and is easily overcome by making sure that objects which are to fade in or out do not have internal polygons. Polygon size is used to explode or implode the current object. In effect, it takes the polygons that define the object and resizes each one of them. A value of 100% would mean that the polygons are their normal size, making the object appear as it was originally designed. A lower setting would cause the size of the polygons to shrink until they vanish. Setting polygon size higher would result in each polygon becoming larger. And yes, there's another envelope button. By the way, if you wanted to use polygon size to create an explosion, use as many tiny polygons as possible. When the explosion occurs, shrink the polygon size and enlarge the scale of the object. 
By turning on polygon edges, the user can tell Lightwave that each and every polygon that defines the current object is to be outlined. The color used to produce these outlines is defined by the edge color to this button's right. Polygon edges are useful for giving an animation the appearance of a Saturday morning cartoon. You'll also find it comes in handy when you wish to provide a more technical appearance to complex objects. Many years ago, Disney brought a character like this one to life for their movie, Tron. The Edge Color button produces a color palette where the user may choose from any of 16.8 million colors. This color will be used to draw the outlines around the current object's polygons if the Polygon Edges button is turned on. If Polygon Edges is not turned on, this color will have no effect. The next set of options tell Lightwave how the object handles shadows. These settings are meaningless unless you are rendering your scene with the Trace Shadows option turned on in the camera panel. Keep in mind that shadows are the result of ray tracing and are extremely time consuming to render. Often it's better to fake shadows with special objects rather than let Lightwave try to calculate them. The Self Shadow option tells Lightwave that, when the circumstances are right, the object is capable of casting a shadow upon itself. When Self Shadow is turned off, this will not occur. Note that objects that would never cast this shadow, such as an illuminated light bulb, should have this option turned off. This will speed up rendering when using the Trace Shadow option within the camera panel due to the fact that Lightwave doesn't have to calculate the shadow. The Cast Shadow option will allow the current object to throw a shadow onto items which may surround it in the scene. Again, this will have no effect unless you are going to have shadows rendered in your scene. As with our example from Self Shadow, a light bulb would most likely never cast a shadow on anything, so this option could be turned off. Receive Shadow, the final object-based shadow option, decides whether or not the object will be hit by shadows from other objects around it. The illuminated light bulb would never receive a shadow, so it is a case where this option could be safely turned off. Again, turning this option off will decrease rendering time when using the Trace Shadow option. That takes care of all the obvious options here on the object's control panel. Now let's go back and take a look at using the motion control panels. Since these controls apply to a number of different options within Lightwave, and we only have a limited amount of time, we'll only go through them once. The motion control screen applies to objects, lights, and camera. As previously mentioned, the motion control screen gives you control over an item's movement within a scene. It offers the following options. Clicking the clear motion button will cause any movement settings specified in this screen to be removed. Motions can be saved as files all their own, and load motion is used to reload them. Objects, lights, and camera all use the same motion file format, so the file you save for one can be used for another. The name of the currently loaded motion file will be shown in the window to this button's right. Save motion allows you to keep a copy of the specified movements for use with other objects, lights, or cameras. There are many good reasons to save motions independently rather than just including them in a scene file, chief among them being that it can save a lot of repetition. Imagine defining a motion for a car's wheel, where the wheel makes one full rotation every 30 frames. Obviously, the rest of the wheels on the car will be doing the same thing. In that case, saving the motion would allow you to load it into the motion control screen of the other tires, saving you some effort. Motion files do not have to be saved separately. When you save a scene that involves motion files, those motions are automatically saved with it. The frame display window provides information on the number of keyframes and the total number of frames defined in a motion file. The end behavior options tell Lightwave what it should do with the object once it has reached the end of its defined motion. If the end behavior is set to reset, the item will return to the settings it had when it was first loaded into Lightwave. In the case of objects, this means that the object will be placed at zero on the X, Y, and Z axes, heading, pitch, and bank will all return to zero, and object size will return to one, or full size. This is certainly the least useful of the three end behavior options. An end behavior setting of stop will cause the item to remain exactly the way it was in the last defined frame of the motion file. This is useful for something that would move into position and then stay there, such as a logo. The repeat end behavior setting will cause the item to go back to the beginning of the motion and start over. 
This would be useful if, for example, you had a spinning tire. You would need only to specify the number of frames that it takes for the tire to make one full rotation, then click Repeat to make the tire spin constantly throughout your animation. With the Parent Object window, the user can tell Lightwave that the motions defined for the current item occur in relation to the motions of another. This is known as hierarchical relationship. The tires of a car, for example, are parented to the car itself. This allows them to rotate independently, but still be in position no matter where the car moves. Target object appears only in the motion control panels for lights and camera. It allows those items to be set to always point at a certain object in the scene. When a target object is specified, the direction option below has no effect. The current keyframe allows you to choose which keyframe of the item's motion you are going to affect with the following buttons. In the current version of Lightwave, keys can only be created within the scene layout portion of the program, which we'll be examining shortly. Clicking position brings up a small window in which you may enter the desired X, Y, and Z positions for the item in the current keyframe. These are specified in meters. Direction brings up a window which allows you to specify the heading, pitch, and bank for the item in the current keyframe. These are specified in degrees. The Scale button brings up a window which allows you to adjust the size of an object along either the X, Y, or Z axis, or any combination of them, for the current keyframe. Normally, an object scale is 1 on each axis for regular dimensions. A setting of 0.5 on any or all of the axes would cause the object to be half its normal size on the specified axis. A setting of 2 would cause it to be twice normal size. The Scale button appears only in the Object Motion Control Panel. The Linear option, when turned on, causes Lightwave to move the item in the most direct method possible to get it from the previous keyframe to the current one. This is useful when a motion is required to be very straight or mechanical. By default, a keyframe is non-linear. The lines in this image show the linear path that the ball should follow. The keyframe positions are marked by spheres. Notice the difference between this ball moving in a linear manner versus the same movement in non-linear. A spline is a smooth curve as defined by a number of placed points. In this case, those placed points are keyframes. The shortest path between two keyframes is, of course, a straight line, but it's not always the best. The spline controls allow you to fiddle with how straight the line between keyframes really is. Tension is used to slow down or speed up the motion or change in behavior of an item as it approaches the keyframe. A setting of zero, the default, signifies that there is no tension on the keyframe, and the item will move at a uniform speed. When tension is set to one, the keyframe acts as a sort of repulsing magnet, causing the item to slow down as it approaches. While not one you would normally use due to its unpredictability, a setting of negative one would cause the object to speed up as it approaches the key. If you changed the default tension in the scene control panel, this value will reflect that amount if it was created after the change. This Mach Universe logo relies heavily on the use of tension. Continuity causes an item to make a more abrupt transition from one tween segment to the next. This is useful when you are trying to make a change of direction more obvious, such as in the excellent DICE tutorial in the Lightwave manual. The default setting 0 signifies normal continuity. Lightwave will use its normal calculations to change directions. A setting of negative 1, however, will result in sharp continuity. This will cause the item to appear to bounce away in the new direction. While other settings are possible, they should be in the 0 to negative 1 range, or your results may be unpredictable. Bias gives you control of the slack in a tween segment. When Lightwave tries to smooth out a change in motion, it causes the item to sweep in the direction away from that where it will go next. This creates the illusion of what is called anticipation in the animation realm. If the bias of a key frame is set to negative 1, the item will sweep into line for its next move immediately before hitting the key. A setting of zero balances the smoothing on both sides of the key. Finally, a setting of one will cause the item to overshoot the keyframe 
and then return to line up with the next move. Other settings are possible, but they should be between the range of 1 and negative 1 to remain predictable. When Use Motion is chosen, all of the settings specified in this control panel will be accepted for use in your animation. Now let's examine the Envelope options. Envelopes are available from a number of different places in Lightwave, as we've seen, and they'll all work in the same manner with the same options. They allow you to animate a given value over a period of time. If, for example, you wanted an object to dissolve into your scene, you would use an envelope from within the Dissolve button. The Clear Envelope button will cause the current envelope settings to be removed from Lightwave's active memory. As with the other clear options in Lightwave, the original data file, if the envelope was loaded from disk at our hard drive, will not be affected in any way. Clicking the Load Envelope button will bring up the standard file requester where you can choose to load an existing definition. Envelopes saved from any envelope control panel can be loaded into any other. Keep in mind, however, that some options work on a different set of values, so this may not always yield the result you were expecting. The name of the loaded envelope file will appear in the field to this button's right. The Save Envelope button will allow you to save the currently defined envelope onto a diskette or hard drive. Try to attach the extension .env to the end of the envelope files that you save so that their content is clear to you later. If you save the file with the same name as an existing file, Lightwave will prompt you to make sure you wish to overwrite the earlier version. Once the file is saved, the name you have given it will appear in the field to the right of the Load Envelope button above. The Create Key button gives you a chance to insert additional points of change for the value within your animation. The keyframes defined here are not considered to be keyframes in the motion and animation sense. This means that if you have a keyframe on frame 30 of your animation defined in an envelope, you won't have one there in your motion unless you define it there as well, and vice versa. The Delete key allows you to remove unwanted or unneeded keys. Normally, the keyframe which is shown in the current keyframe is offered as the frame to be deleted, but you can specify any existing frame for deletion simply by typing over the one provided. Remember, envelope keys are not the same as motion keys. Deleting one won't delete the other. To the right of the Create and Delete buttons is the Key Information window. This window provides information on the total number of keyframes specified for the envelope, as well as the number of frames the envelope covers. The center of the screen is dominated by the envelope visualizer, which gives you a chance to see exactly what your envelope looks like. Keyframes are designated by a small cross-shaped mark, with lines connecting one key to the next. The height of these markings illustrates the level at which the option is invoked upon those keyframes. A mark at the bottom of the visualizer usually represents a setting of zero, while one at the top would normally represent a level of 100%. Since it is possible to set these levels higher than 100%, the visualizer is a dynamic illustration, always resulting in the highest level at the very top of the display. In the same vein, the lowest setting would always be at the very bottom of the display. When this is the case, a straight dotted line will always mark the 0% level. The window is also dynamic from side to side, with the final keyframe always located at the far right of the display. The current keyframe window is used to specify the keyframe which you are currently adjusting. This frame is specified by using the small arrows located to the right of the window, which cycle through the defined keys. Envelope value allows you to set the level to which the specified action is invoked. In the case of Morph, a setting of 0% would mean that the original object is the only one seen. A setting of 100%, on the other hand, would mean that the object is fully converted into its new shape. The envelope value may be set to any number, though settings above 100% or below 0% are rarely useful. The linear setting for an envelope key behaves in the same manner as it would with a motion key. Rather than Lightwave averaging the transition, a linear setting would cause a very direct path from one setting to another. An example of this is best found with another option that allows envelopes, light intensity. A light which was controlled by a switch is either on or off. A linear path would make sense for this type of light, since it performs a constant ramp from being dark 
to being lit. If the same light were controlled by a dimmer knob, however, a nonlinear path would probably be best. This would result in a curve in the illumination increase. The linearity setting affects only the frames between the one with the option specified and the previous key. The spline control options in an envelope behave exactly as those in a motion. To remind you, tension would cause the effect to slow down or speed up as it approached the key. Continuity would cause a change in settings to be emphasized or de-emphasized. Bias would cause the rate of acceleration or deceleration to be placed before, upon, or after the key. Remember that choosing the linear option overrides all three of the spline controls. The Use Envelope button will cause the specified envelope to be activated when the scene is animated and return you to the previous option screen. By the way, envelopes automatically get saved when you save your scene. By clicking the Free Envelope button, you tell Lightwave that you do not wish to retain the envelope for animation. Note that once you choose Free Envelope, the envelope is completely removed from Lightwave's memory. If you think for any reason that you may need this envelope again, make sure to save it using the Save Envelope option at the top of the screen. Lightwave gives you complete control over the material from which an object is constructed. When an object is defined, various parts of it are given a surface name. Once the object is loaded into Lightwave, each surface name can be modified independently of the others. Using the options we are about to examine, you could create just about any type of material you can imagine and many you can't. The first and most obvious adjustment you can make to a surface is its surface color. When this button is chosen, you are presented with an RGB color mixer which allows you to specify any of more than 16.7 million colors. This is accomplished by defining the amount of red, green, and blue existing in the desired color. A color box along the bottom of the screen displays the result of the current RGB settings. You can't see it in our image because we're using a black and white output. The color mixer also contains a button marked Texture. Clicking on this button brings you to still more possibilities, and you'll find the Texture button in most of the options to follow. Since the options within the Texture area rely on many things we haven't yet explored, we'll be covering all of them later in this tape. A luminous surface is one that glows as if it is self-lit. In Lightwave 2.0, a luminous surface is not automatically considered to be actually casting light. If you were to create a model of a light bulb, for example, and provide it with a luminous surface definition, objects around it would not look as if they were being affected by it. The solution in a case like this is to place a legitimate light source inside your model. At first thought, this doesn't seem to be a realistic approach, simply because if it were inside something, how would light escape? Lightwave offers a number of interesting answers to that question. The most obvious would be to make the bulb semi or completely transparent. Handling the problem in this manner, however, tends to leave you with a rather dull light bulb. Instead, make use of the shadow options available to each object. By turning off the light bulb's ability to cast shadows, you effectively allow light to pass directly through the surface of the bulb. While we're at it, a lit light bulb would never receive a shadow, nor would it cast a shadow on itself, so these can also be turned off both solving the problem and cutting down on valuable rendering time. A luminous surface is perhaps best considered to be one which is always rendered at the full color level specified in the surface color settings. It is also a way to give rich, vibrant, and constant colors to animations, lending itself to the Saturday morning cartoon school of animation. Since every object is built as a wireframe model which is filled in using a specified set of surface attributes, it is a simple matter to have Lightwave render the object without the attributes. When the Outline Only option is chosen, the associated surface will be drawn using the original wireframe construction. This is useful when a CAD-type architecture look is desired, or when wishing to portray what is commonly perceived as old-fashioned computer animation. Keep in mind that the surface attributes will still come into play, but only so far as defining the material that the wire is made out of. The word diffuse is defined by Webster as spread out and not concentrated. That definition makes understanding the function of the diffuse surface option much simpler. A high level of diffusion will cause light hitting a particular surface to spread out across the surface in a very generous manner. 
the reverse, a very low level, would cause the light to be much more restricted. This would result in the appearance of a dull or matte surface. In this animation, we can see the results achieved by different diffusion level settings. The block to the upper left has a diffusion level of 10%, the next 20, the next 30, and so on, concluding with a 100% level on the lower right. As you can see, a wide variety of surfaces are available simply by using the diffuse option. So what does the diffusion level tell us about the surface? It tells us the coarseness of the material. A material with very high diffusion would most likely be perfectly smooth, such as the paint job on your brand new car. A surface with a great deal of roughness, and we're talking on a pretty minute scale here, tends to bounce light back in a tremendous variety of directions. A piece of charcoal is a good example of such a surface, and would be considered a low diffusion surface. As a default, Lightwave does its best to make shading appear smooth and even. A gradual transition from fully lit to fully dark is the technique required for most everyday items, but some, such as planets in space, require more harsh shading. This is where the sharp terminator comes into play. When this option is active, the transition becomes much more dramatic, giving the illusion of an object which is lit by a tremendously bright light in an especially dark environment. Both objects in this animation have the same surface attributes, the only difference being that the sharp terminator is turned on for the rightmost block. This option is basically a modifier for the diffuse setting, and is found next to it to remind you of their relationship. Specularity is the factor which specifies how shiny a material is. You'll notice that in real-world objects, some offer a very clear image of the light source that is hitting it, while others do not. That light source reflection is often referred to as a hot spot. A surface with a high level of specularity would provide a very sharp and bright image of the light source, while a lower level would cause the light hot spot to be muted and indistinct. This animation shows us the way that various specularity settings behave within our 3D environment. Again, the upper left block is set to 10%, progressing to a 100% level on the block to the lower right. Notice the way the hot spot travels in the course of each block's rotation. Highly polished items, such as a gemstone or fine china, are examples of surfaces that would require a very high specularity setting to recreate properly. Duller, less brilliant items, such as the charcoal again, would be more accurately reproduced using a near-zero specularity. When light hits most surfaces, the hot spots are normally colored in relation to the color of the light source. Many materials, however, such as metals, lend their own surface color to the highlight. If you look, for example, at a gold ring under a white light, the highlights are not white, but yellow. When color highlights is turned on, Lightwave combines the color of the light source and the color of the surface in such a way as to provide the correct lighting colors. Since highlights are generated by the level of specularity, you'll find the two options grouped together. If specularity is set to zero, color highlights will have no effect. Glossiness works in conjunction with specularity to define the size of a hotspot's halo. If an object has a specularity setting of zero, glossiness settings won't change a thing. When glossiness is set to high, the hotspot will be very tight, with virtually no halo effects surrounding. A low setting would result in a very loose hotspot, with a fairly large halo, while a medium setting would be somewhere in between. This animation shows the results of the three glossiness settings upon blocks with a diffusion level of 50% and a specularity level of 85%, progressing from low, then medium, and finally high. Specularity and glossiness do not cause a surface to reflect the items around it in Lightwave 3D. This is controlled by yet another option, reflection. An integral part of using the reflection abilities of Lightwave is the reflected image setting, which appears immediately beneath it. If no image is specified, the surface will reflect anything in the environment, whether they be other objects or backgrounds. When an image is specified, however, the surface will reflect only that image. This animation shows the results achieved when using a variety of reflection map levels with the Kiki.vt frame store provided with your toaster software used as a reflected image. As usual, the upper left block represents a 10% level, and the lower right block illustrates 100%. Notice that the blocks are not reflecting each other or the background colors. 
This animation, on the other hand, uses no image for reflection, simply the reflection levels outlined previously. As you can see, the blocks now reflect each other. True environment reflections like this only occur when the Trace Reflections option is turned on within the camera area of LightWave. It also takes quite a lot more rendering time. Reflections have a couple of minor limitations. First, single points do not get reflected. What this means is that if you have a sky full of stars which are all one-point polygons, you won't see them reflected in the surface of a lake, for example. Second, images placed in the background using the backdrop options don't get reflected. As you can see in this animation, there is no reflection of the red gradient backdrop. That is because both that gradient and the word reflection are simply a background image rather than actually existing in the 3D world. The transparency options give you the ability to create see-through surfaces. It could be used for anything from glass or crystal to nylon or cellophane. This animation shows our usual cast of blocks with the usual variety of settings. 10% on the upper left, 100% on the lower right. As you can see, these objects don't quite feel solid. There's a simple explanation for that. We're looking at one-sided polygons. In order to provide the feeling of depth and solidity, we need to be able to see the polygons which would be inside the object. There are two easy solutions to this. The first is to build the object with double-sided polygons in the first place. The other option is often the better of the two. Activate the double-sided option, located at the bottom of the surface area. This causes all polygons with that surface definition to be rendered as if they had polygons inside. One major advantage of using this technique is in memory savings. Every defined polygon which is loaded into LightWave takes up a little more of your valuable memory, not to mention moving you closer and closer to LightWave's own internal polygon limits. Using the double-sided surface option, however, does not count the new polygons as existing. Whenever you are using double-sided polygons of either sort, however, rendering time rises due to the increased volume of calculation and drawing that LightWave must perform. The color filter is an option relating to transparent surfaces only. When this option is chosen, the color of the transparent surface will serve to color whatever may be seen through it. Imagine looking through a piece of red glass. In the real world, everything you see through that glass would be tinted red. That is the result of the red glass acting as a color filter. This animation shows two of our blocks, the first not using color filter and the second with color filter turned on. Both of these blocks are set with identical surfaces consisting of a red color at a value of 175, 50% diffusion, 85% specularity, 85% transparency, and double sides. As light travels through certain substances, it is bent and distorted by them. The index of refraction is a scientific standard which has been around since the early days of science, listing various substances' refractive offsets. A comprehensive usable list of all of these values is tremendously hard to find, but NewTek has put together a fairly good one in the Video Toaster manual. For ease of use, you'll find that list reproduced in the Taming the Wave handbook. Refraction only produces results when using a semi-transparent surface, and the higher the level of refraction you use, the more rendering time you can look forward to. This animation represents some of the more common refractive levels. The first block is set to 1.0, representing air. Next is 1.330, representing water. Third is 1.553, representing quartz. Then 2.0, the level of crystal, and finally 2.420, representing diamond. Some surfaces appear to have very defined edges, while others do not. A perfect example of one with a prominent edge is a piece of glass. The edge transparency options allow you to choose the way edges on your own surfaces appear. Using the opaque option, a very strong edge will appear, as is seen in the first block. The next block is using the normal setting, while the third is using transparent edges. An object with transparent edges will appear to blend more smoothly with its surroundings. Edge Threshold is an advanced modifier for the edge transparency options. It allows you to define the gradations between the specified edge transparency setting and the surface color. By setting this value low, you will cause the blend to be more subtle or smoother. A high level, however, would result in a more abrupt transition.
The difference between our various blocks is very subtle, but it is there. Take a close look at the upper left block, set to an edge threshold level of 0.2, and the lower right block, set to 2.0. Edge threshold has no effect unless the edge transparency setting is opaque or transparent. The bump map button allows you to add hills or valleys to the surface of an object. These bumps can be defined by a large number of options closely related to those in the texture areas we've been skipping over. We'll examine both the texture maps and bump maps in a moment. Since all objects are built out of perfectly flat polygons, it would take a tremendous number of polygons to reproduce a perfectly smooth surface. Since this is an unreasonable demand for 3D rendering, an algorithm has been developed which causes adjoining polygons to appear to form a continuous smooth surface. This is known as Fong shading. If the angle between two adjacent polygons is 90 degrees or sharper, smoothing will not be applied, leaving an edge. This makes it simple to give the object an appearance of having seams. As explained in the discussion about transparency, double-sided causes all of the polygons with the current surface name to be duplicated facing the opposite direction. This option is important when producing glass-like objects. The block on the left has glass-like settings, but no double sides. Notice that the right block looks much more convincing. Lightwave also offers a few more options for adjusting your surface attributes. In many of the options we've just explored was a button marked Texture. A texture can be any of a number of types and can be applied in a tremendous number of ways. First, let's look at these types one by one. The planar image map texture type is used to cast pictures onto a surface, much like a traditional movie or slide projector. Images can be anything from a frame of video you grabbed with the toaster's freeze option to a picture you drew in a compatible paint package. The texture image field is where you let Lightwave know which image or series of images you wish to use in the projection. To load an image for use with any of Lightwave's image-based operations, simply load it from the image's control panel. We'll be looking at that area later in the tape. Since planar image mapping works like a projector, it must be placed like a projector. The texture axis allows you to choose the direction the projector points. If the projector doesn't point directly at the face of the polygon you wish to apply texture to, the image may appear smeared. This is just like the result you might get if you rotated a projector screen 90 degrees. The direction as far as up or down a particular axis has no relevance, so long as the axis is correct. Images come in many different sizes and types, and each demands its own sizing requirements on a surface. Automatic sizing takes the pain out of this operation by setting the texture size so that the image will fit perfectly. Note, however, that any image map settings you may have already defined will be lost once Lightwave performs this calculation. A warning prompt appears before the action begins. Also, if you have multiple polygons with the same surface name, Lightwave will include every piece in its measurement. Without careful planning, this can give you results you weren't expecting. Sometimes, however, your texture requirements can't be met by use of automatic sizing, and you need more precise control. That's where texture size comes in. Here you can adjust the X, Y, and Z axis sizing individually or as a group. These amounts are expressed in meters. A negative number will result in the image being reversed on the specified axis. If you've used automatic sizing, Lightwave fills in the texture size with its results. This can serve as a useful jumping off point for complicated sizing work. By default, the texture center is 000, meaning that the image is centered upon the object's origin. With Texture Center, you can change that position to be anywhere you may need it. This comes in handy when working with odd-shaped objects. There's an important connection here that you need to start noticing. If you set the Texture Center to the same figures as the Texture Size, the image will appear unmoved. Imagine an endless string of cars, much like the Los Angeles freeways, each one exactly the same. If the line advances by one car, the next car takes its place, and so on, and so on. This concept pops up in a few different places in Lightwave, so remember it. Normally, a texture stays attached to a surface anywhere it may move, keeping its original position on the object. At times, however, you may want an object to move, but not the texture on it. When world coordinates is turned on, the image will be visible on the moving surface as an endless series of image tiles, which, by the way, is the way Lightwave always sees images. 
Sizing options are still in effect, but now relate to the scene's origin, not the objects. When an image is applied to a surface, the original surface color setting is ignored. By setting fall off, you can cause the image to fade out as it progresses further from the texture center. This is expressed in percentage of fall off per meter and can be different for all three axes. With texture velocity, you can put your images in motion on a surface. Simply enter the amount of movement on any axis per frame, then render. The image will appear to be a scrolling series of image tiles. You can decrease or remove the tile seams by using what are known as seamless images. These are pictures constructed so that the left side matches the right side and or the top matches the bottom. Here you see an example of a seamless image map in use. This texture, by the way, is called Cyclone and is part of JEK Graphics Profils Volume 2. You'll find this image in the TTW Images drawer on Taming the Wave Disk 1. Some images work better when they're seen as a negative. Still other situations can take advantage of it as a special effect. Simply click Negative Image and all of the image's colors will be reversed. Note that this works best with black and white images. When image mapped surfaces get to be too close to the camera, pixels tend to appear creating a mosaic pattern. In most cases, this is not desired. Pixel blending will attempt to smooth out the pixels by averaging colors. For those of you already familiar with Electronic Arts Deluxe Paint 4 paint package, this is much like using a smoothing tool on a jagged line. Anti-aliasing is almost the reverse of pixel blending, but not quite. Used when image map surfaces move far away from the camera or when working with a complicated image, anti-aliasing will tend to diminish flickering and image breakup. Use Texture accepts any changes you may have made for the surface and returns you to the surface's control panel. Free Texture allows you to exit the texture and release it. Make sure this is what you really mean to do. The cylindrical image map is identical to the planar image map with a couple of minor changes. For the sake of time, I'm only going to mention the differences. The direction of casting works a little bit different with this and the next type of texture, spherical image map. Rather than pointing the projector at the face of the surface, you want to point parallel to the surface. This animation of globes explains what I'm talking about. The spheres each have the exact same settings, the only exception being that the first is cast along X, the next Y, and the third Z. Notice that only the image cast along Y has the proper orientation. Texture size's only real difference is that the only size adjustment that changes the result is on the texture axis. In other words, if the image is being projected down Y, only changes to the Y texture axis would accomplish anything. Width tiling allows you to specify the number of times an image is repeated around the surface that you're mapping on. This can be set to any whole number. The larger the number, the more images you're going to get. Spherical image map is virtually identical to cylindrical image map. One new option is added for tiling control. We've already looked at how width tiling works, and height tiling does the same job along the projection axis. If, for example, height tiling was set to 18, the image would be repeated as 18 tiles. The number of images in width tiling times the number of images in height tiling will give the total number of images wrapped on the surface. As might be expected, checkerboard creates a pattern of alternating colors. This is accomplished by using the surface color as one set and the texture color as the other set. In this texture type, texture size defines the size of the squares. This is set in meters and each axis can be altered individually. The color specified here is used alternately with that set in surface color. It uses a standard RGB color gadget to set the color. Note that the color you specify here will be used as the center square in your checkerboard. Checkerboard is the first of what are called procedural textures. What this means is that the computer generates them based on a mathematical formula. The procedural textures are not just projections, like the image maps, but actually have a three-dimensional existence. Mapping these on round surfaces can have some unusual results. Again, the name explains the function. The same options as those found in Checkerboard, and with the same purpose. One new option makes an appearance here as well. Line thickness lets you define the thickness of the grid lines. This is defined in meters. Remember that this is another procedural texture, so using it on rounded surfaces could be complicated. 
Yet another name that makes the purpose clear. Unfortunately, dots can only generate truly round dots. Only one new option here. In this texture type, texture size defines the distance between the center of one dot and the center of the next. Dot diameter allows you to set the distance from one side of a dot to the other side. If dot diameter is set higher than the texture size, the entire surface will be the color of a dot. This is where we start getting into the complicated stuff. You see, the marble texture doesn't produce nice looking marble without a lot of work. Most 3D artists use image maps of marble grabbed with a video camera, which is very quick and easy. The rule with texture access when used with marble is that there are no rules. Depending on the type of surface you wish to create, any of the three axes may be best for you. In this case, texture size lets you set the amount of variance within your marble. Imagine the texture size marked off as an endless series of grid squares. Each time the pattern enters a new grid square, the pattern will deviate. The smaller you set the texture size, the more radical the marble will appear. Texture color only appears in the marble texture when it is accessed through surface color. This specifies the color of the streaks in your marble, while the surface color itself will be used as the primary color. Frequencies is used to specify the amount of detail within your marble by roughing up the edges of the streaks. The higher the setting here, the more complex your marble will be. The acceptable range for this value is 1 to 16, but the higher this is set, the longer the rendering time. Six frequencies will usually give you a nice result. Turbulence allows you to define how close one vein may wander to another in your marble texture. Just about any value can be used here, and each project has its own best setting. Vein spacing determines the distance between veins' original starting places, rather than after calculations. Again, just about any value may be used, but each project is likely to require a different setting. Keep in mind that vein spacing and turbulence are closely related. Vein sharpness allows you to specify the amount of blending that will occur between the primary surface color and the texture color streaks. A high vein sharpness setting will result in the two colors being clearly different, while a lower setting will give you smooth transitions from one to the other. The wood texture has the same disadvantage as marble. It generates a wood-like texture rather than a convincing wood in most cases. Also, like marble, most animators use image-mapped wood rather than generating it in this manner. Wood can be useful for other types of surfaces, so don't dismiss it completely. All of the wood options are comparable to those in marble, but rather than producing swirls and streaks, wood produces rings. The underwater texture creates a pattern much like what you might see at the bottom of a swimming pool with a choppy surface. The wave sources setting works much like frequencies in the other textures. Each wave source will add another set of waves affecting the pattern. The valid range for wave sources is 1 to 16. The more wave sources used, the longer the rendering time. Wavelength allows you to specify how close the waves in your texture will get to one another. The higher the wavelength, the farther apart the waves will be. The band sharpness is virtually identical to the ring and vein sharpness in wood and marble, respectively. Fractal noise is probably the most useful of all of the texture types. While the concept of fractals is a bit much to get into here, suffice it to say that it generates seemingly random patches of color on a surface. Here you can see examples of fractal noise simulating clouds and wood. The fractal noise options are similar to those in the other texture types. Each of these texture types can be used as any of a number of different surface definitions. By using fractal noise to generate a transparency map, storm clouds float across the sky in this scene. A cracked mud image is used as a diffusion map on the ground to darken a brown surface color. You could also use any of them as specularity or reflection maps. When used in these applications, the image is converted to black and white. Then, LightWave determines the amount of the surface quality by how light or dark the image is. The darker the color is, the less of the attribute is applied. This image shows a picture frame created by using only a bump map. 
Many of the texture types we have explored can be used as bump maps, with fractal noise appearing as fractal bumps. The primary difference between bump maps and other texture maps is that bump map textures include an option called amplitude. This determines how high the brightest parts of the image will be in the rendering. A setting of 0% means that it will not create raised surfaces, while a setting of 100% would have a great amount of height variance. Bump map does not give you true depth on a surface. Let's rotate this picture frame and you'll see what I mean. If you want your surface to have true bumps, you're going to have to model it that way in the first place. Lightwave's image control panel provides you with a number of options for importing pictures into your animations. Clicking clear all images will cause a prompt to appear, making sure that you really want to drop all of the images you may have loaded. This won't affect the original image files, but will disable any image maps you may be using. The field to the right of this button lets you know how many images are currently loaded. Load Image brings up your traditional file requester where you may specify a single image file to load. An image must be in Toaster Frame Store, Toaster RGB, or Amiga IFF format. Pictures in your scenes don't just have to be stills. Lightwave will also allow you to give it just the prefix of a series of numbered pictures. On frame 5, for example, the image displayed would be video.005 if video dot was the prefix you used. The current image field lets you specify a loaded picture to be deleted or to check the image's statistics. The field directly below this one displays the resolution, number of bit planes, and memory usage for this image. Note that the lower the resolution and or bit planes, the less memory the image will consume. Clicking Clear Image will produce a requester making sure that you wish to release the current image from memory. By using Frame Offset on the current image, it is possible to use only a portion of an image sequence in your animation. If you wanted the sequence to begin with the tenth image, for example, and were rendering your animation from frame one, simply enter nine here. This is useful if you need to have a sequence continue into a second scene. Loop Sequence activates the Loop Length option to its right. If an image sequence ends before the total number of frames in an animation, the images will be replaced with black. Using Loop Sequence, you can change the playing time of that sequence. If you are using a 30 image sequence, the loop length will automatically be set to 30. This means that Lightwave will spread the 30 images over 30 frames and then start over. If the loop length were set to 15, Lightwave would compress the animation and repeat it every 15 frames. Lightwave is capable of placing images or colors in the background of an animation which you create. This is handled through the backdrop options. An image created using another software package, or even one rendered previously by Lightwave, can be placed in the background of your animation using the background image option. Currently, any image in the Amiga IFF, Toaster Frame Store, or Macintosh Picked formats are acceptable for this application. Note that an image used in this manner is not considered to be a solid surface. This means it will never cast a shadow, receive a shadow, reflect, or refract in a scene. Further, it is not possible to move a background image, so if your camera moves in a scene, the backdrop will remain unchanged. An image is selected for this purpose by locating its name using the arrows to the right of the field. It is possible to use a sequence of images in the background, allowing you to simulate animation or just change backgrounds. To accomplish this, simply use the Load Sequence option in the Images area to import the files. The images must all have the same file name, differentiated only by the numbers appended to the end of them. These numbers correspond to the frame number in which that image will appear. The foreground image acts exactly as the background image, only it appears between the camera and any objects in the animation. A foreground image is useful when you wish the animation to appear as if it is being viewed through or behind something. This animation shows an image sequence which was originally shot in front of a green screen used as a foreground key. The screen was replaced with a Taming the Wave logo, then the entire sequence was saved to the hard drive. That sequence then served as an image map sequence for the monitor screen with a loop. Here's the original footage. 
Foreground image has the same limitations as background image in that it doesn't cast or receive shadows, reflect, refract, or move. Foreground dissolve is used to fade the picture specified as the foreground image into or out of the scene. The value may be set as a constant percentage or animated over time using an envelope. A good use of this function might be when the effect of a frozen video image becoming a 3D scene is desired. The foreground key allows you to mark certain colors from the foreground image as being transparent. This would allow animation within your scene to be visible through those colors. They are specified by the low clip color and high clip color settings to this button's right. With our green screen example, low clip and high clip were both shades of green. When used in conjunction with the foreground key, low clip color will tell Lightwave the lowest RGB values to treat as transparent in a foreground image. High clip color defines the maximum RGB values which Lightwave will consider transparent in the foreground image. Neither the high clip nor the low clip have any effect unless the foreground key is turned on. Lightwave is capable of producing a color gradient in the background of your scene using four user-definable colors. This is useful for creating a quick landscape, as the default shows, or any number of special visual effects. The zenith color is that which would be directly in front of the camera if it were pointing straight up. In the case of a natural landscape, this would be a dark blue. The sky color would represent the shade at the point where the sky meets the ground on the horizon. A natural landscape would have a pale blue here, which would blend upwards to the zenith. The ground color is that which is seen at the point where the ground meets the sky on the horizon. A natural landscape would most likely contain a dark brown. The nadir color is what would be seen if the camera pointed directly down. A natural landscape would have a light brown here, which would blend into the distance to the ground color. By clicking the Zenith Only button, you can tell Lightwave to not generate a gradient, but use only the color specified as Zenith as a background. If your animation required a black background, for example, simply set the Zenith to black and then turn on Zenith Only. The fog effect options allow you to specify a haze in the distance for any number of purposes. In order for fog to function properly, there must be polygons in the distance. Fog does not work with backdrop items such as background images or color gradients. When the fog off option is active, all other settings in this portion of the panel will be ignored by Lightwave when the scene is rendered. Linear fog causes Lightwave to render what is essentially a solid cube of fog in the distance as specified by the fog maximum and minimum distances found below it. The color of this fog is determined using the fog color button. If you're trying to simulate real fog, don't use this option. Notice that in this animation, the train almost seems to be coming out of a wall of fog. Nonlinear fog provides the gaps between layers of fog that are found in real life. It results in a much more realistic illusion than linear in this respect. Here's the same animation using nonlinear fog. Notice that there's a much more realistic feel to this than the other. Here's the linear fog again. The fog minimum distance gives Lightwave the starting point of the fog. This is specified in meters and is judged from the position of the camera. If the camera moves, the fog will move right along with it, keeping this distance between it and the camera at all times. The fog maximum distance tells Lightwave the distance from the camera that the fog is completely opaque. As with fog minimum distance, this amount of space will always stay the same regardless of the camera's movement and is specified in meters. When working with fog, keep in mind that these distances specify the density of the fog. If, for example, the minimum distance were 1 and the maximum distance were 2, the fog would be very dense indeed. The same minimum distance with a maximum of 1,000, however, would result in very light fog. The fog color setting determines the color of the fog at maximum distance, where it is completely solid. 
A good setting for this color when attempting to simulate real fog is a very pale gray, somewhere around the RGB values of 150, 150, 150. When the backdrop fog button is active, the colors specified in the zenith, sky, ground, and nadir settings are used in place of the fog color. This is useful when you wish something to simply vanish into the distance rather than traveling through a mist. Lighting is one of the most important parts of 3D animation. The world around us is a complex place, and lighting can range from painfully subtle to startlingly harsh. We'll be exploring lighting techniques later in this tape, but for now, let's take a look at the options available for use with LightWave. Clicking on the Clear All Lights button will prompt you to confirm that you wish to remove every light setting you currently have specified. If you accept, LightWave will leave only light number one, and it will be restored to its default settings. The field to the right of this button displays the total number of lights currently defined. LightWave allows a virtually unlimited number of light sources to be included in your scenes. These lights are numbered in the order in which they were created. Clicking the Add Light button will cause a single light to be added to the end of that list. Note that the more light sources a scene contains, the longer it will take LightWave to render that scene. Ambient light is not so much a light source as an environment light. It has no specific point of origin, but serves to portray light which is reflected off of the items in the environment in general. For example, if a desk is sitting in an office with an overhead light source, the underside of the desk is not just a black mass. Light is being bounced off of the floor, walls, and other items around it, providing a slight amount of illumination to the underside. There is a term for this action of light bouncing off things onto others, radiosity. Unfortunately, LightWave does not currently support radiosity, but you can partially simulate it using ambient light. The ambient color allows you to specify the color of environmental light. The ambient intensity controls the amount of environmental light found in the scene. Another way to visualize this control is that it is used to specify the darkness of shadows. The more ambient light found in the scene, the lighter the shadows, but the image will appear washed out and overlit if the value is set too high. This is normally set to 25%. You can change this to any other solid number or animate it over time using an envelope. A setting of 0% would provide no ambient light, and areas not directly hit by any other light sources in the scene would be rendered as completely black. This would be appropriate for a scene in which the camera was walking through a pitch black room using a flashlight as its only source of light, for example. This animation shows the effect of ramping the ambient intensity up over a period of time. The current light window tells which light you are modifying by adjusting any of the settings below. The arrows to the right of this window allow you to step through your existing lights. Clicking the Clear Light button will cause the light currently identified in the current light window to be removed from the scene after an affirmative answer to a prompt. If you wish to remove one other than the one identified there, step to it using the arrows to the right of the field, then choose Clear Light. Since just about any item within LightWave can move throughout the course of an animation, this option permits you to specify a path of motion for a light source. When selected, this button will take you to a motion control panel where you may specify the motion characteristics of the currently specified light source using the same options found within the object motion. All of the options found in this area operate in the same way as the previous version. The light color button allows you to specify the color of the currently selected light source. With the light intensity button, the brightness of the specified light source may be given a constant number or animated over time with the use of an envelope. The first light source is generated with a default setting of 100%, meaning full brightness. Lights created after the first are defaulted to a 50% brightness. To the right of the light intensity option is a toggle button labeled shadow casting. By turning this option on, the light will cast shadows on objects which have shadow options enabled. If, however, this option is turned off, that particular light will cause no shadows to be cast anywhere in the scene, greatly reducing rendering time. 
This option lends itself to a unique type of lighting control by adding a non-shadow casting light in the exact same position as one which does cast a shadow, the brightness of the non-shadow casting light will serve as a control knob for the shadow brightness in the scene. Lightwave allows for three different types of light sources within a scene. Note, however, that none of these three types produce a visible source of light. If you want the light to appear to be coming from a light bulb, for example, you would need to have an actual light bulb model at the location of the light source. The distant type has no specific point of origin, but is controlled by the direction it points. When used, a constant stream of light is cast in the direction the light points. This is useful for scenes in which a light source is a tremendous distance away, such as a scene on Earth lit by the sun. When using a distant light source, the falloff, cone angle, and edge angle below have no effect on the source. The point type provides light outward in all directions from a single position in space. This sort of light could be used to simulate a light bulb in a scene. When using a point light source, falloff may be used, but cone angle and edge angle have no effect on the source. The spot type behaves exactly as a standard spotlight would in the real world. It projects a beam of light in a single direction controlled by the direction the spot points. When using a spot light source, the falloff, cone angle, and edge angle settings all affect the source. The falloff setting may be used only with point or spot light source types. It controls the speed at which the light dissipates as it moves away from the source. Falloff is specified as a percentage that defines the amount of falloff per meter. If, for example, you had a point or spotlight set to a 50% falloff, the light one meter from the source would be half as bright as the light at the source. A 100% level would mean that the light has no effect at all on surfaces farther than one meter from the source, while a setting of 0% would cause the light to continue infinitely in an unchanged state. The cone angle setting applies only to a spot light type. It controls the size of the beam of light produced. This is specified in degrees, with higher values producing a larger beam of light. Cone angle is measured from the center of the beam of light to the outside edge. Edge angle works in conjunction with cone angle, and therefore only on spot light types. It controls the thickness of the fuzzy areas at the edge of the beam. The edge angle is entered in degrees, which are then subtracted from the cone angle. The larger the edge angle, the fuzzier the light's edge will appear. If, for example, your cone angle is set to 30 degrees and your edge angle is set to 10 degrees, you retain an effective light circle spanning only 20 degrees while the rest is used as a blending zone. As the name implies, the camera control panel gives you access to your camera settings within a scene. The camera motion button gives you the ability to control the movement of the camera throughout the scene. The options found in this area are identical to those found within the light motion controls. The zoom factor is used to specify the camera's magnification level. It may be set with either a constant number or animated over time using an envelope. The default zoom setting is 2.4. A higher setting will increase the level of magnification while a lower setting will decrease it. Note that the zoom option provides a substantially different effect than simply moving the camera closer to or further from the scene. Here you can see an example of camera move and then a camera zoom. The saturation level is used to specify the amount of color to be used in rendering a scene. This value may be set as a constant number or animated over time using an envelope. The default setting of 100% causes Lightwave to render the scene in full color, while a level of zero would result in the image being rendered in grayscale, simulating black and white. When single-point polygons, such as stars, are moving within a scene, the illusion of smooth motion tends to get lost. By turning on the Motion Blur option, you can tell Lightwave to leave a trail behind these objects to give a more realistic result. Note that motion blur affects only single point polygons. Motion blur is also useful for simulating rain, sparks, and a number of other unusual elements. 
We'll be exploring these techniques later in the tape. Blur length is used in conjunction with motion blur to specify the length of trail that single point polygons leave behind. A standard film camera would be simulated by using the default setting of 50%, but longer or shorter trails may be specified as required. The remaining options in the camera control panel are used to specify the type of image output LightWave will use when rendering the scene. The first set of buttons is for defining the rendering technique. If the wireframe method is used, LightWave will draw the entire scene with unfilled polygons. This method is useful for giving the illusion of CAD-type animation. Wireframe does not use hidden line removal, so you'll be able to see all of the polygon outlines, not just those facing the camera. This is essentially the same as turning outline only on for every surface in the scene. The quick rendering method will produce an image using the proper surface colors, but without shading, transparency, or texture mapping. If you simply need to make sure that camera angles are satisfactory, this is the rendering technique to use. It produces images much faster than the next option, normal rendering, and provides solid surfaces unlike wireframe. The normal rendering mode takes into account all of the settings you have specified throughout LightWave. If any of the ray trace options to the right of these buttons are active, they will be calculated into the image. Even without these options, however, the output from normal rendering will contain the correct shading, transparency, and texture mapping which you have specified for the scene. The options to the right of the rendering technique options are, as just mentioned, ray trace options. Using any of these options will greatly increase the time required by LightWave when rendering, so use them wisely. The Trace Shadows option causes LightWave to calculate accurate shadows as would be cast by light sources set as shadow casting sources. If none of the lights in the scene are capable of casting shadows, this option would be a complete waste of time. Equally, if none of the objects in the scene have their shadow options turned on, this option would also be pointless. Due to the fact that this is a ray tracing option, rendering times increase dramatically when it is turned on. Note that if your scene contains a generated backdrop, such as a gradient, image, or solid color, it will receive no shadows. This includes the default ground and sky backdrop colors. These items do not exist in the 3D environment. If you need the backdrop to receive shadows, you must use an actual polygon with the desired image, if any, texture mapped upon it. The Trace Reflections option causes LightWave to calculate accurate reflections within a scene. Only surfaces with a reflection value higher than zero will actually be affected. Any other objects in the scene will be reflected in those surfaces, provided that the reflective surface does not have a reflected image or procedural map upon it. Certain items, such as single-point polygons, as would be used for stars, for example, Two-point lines and outlines are not able to be reflected. We'll explore a simple technique for getting around this limitation later in the tape. Further, the image anti-aliasing feature when used upon an image map surface is not able to be reflected. The reflection of it upon other objects will not be anti-aliased. Finally, generated backdrop items such as gradients, images, or solid colors are not reflected. Again, this is a ray tracing option, so images will take substantially longer to render with it active. The Trace Refraction option causes LightWave to offset light passing through a semi-transparent surface, providing it has a refractive level specified. This is perhaps the most time-consuming of all the ray trace options, so don't use it unless you really need it. Refraction tracing has the same limitations as reflection tracing, in that it cannot deal with single or double point polygons, outlines, or backdrop gradients, backdrop images, solid backdrop colors, or image anti-aliasing. The next set of options are used to specify the render resolution. The higher the render resolution, the longer it will take LightWave to render the image, but the image quality will also improve noticeably. LightWave is not able to render directly to the full color display, so it draws each image in segments. These segments are then moved to the display and the next segment is rendered. The number of segments required is in direct relation to the resolution you are rendering in. 
The super low res mode is extremely fast but outputs at only 160 by 100 pixels. The resulting image will be very rough. This resolution is useful for quick checks of surface settings, camera angles, and the like, or even to record an animation test quickly. When Lightwave renders in super low res, it uses only one render segment. The low resolution mode is only slightly slower than super low res, but produces images at twice the quality, 320 by 200. Low resolution is an excellent choice for client preview animations because of its compromise between speed and quality. Low resolution requires only one render segment. The medium resolution mode is the next slowest step, and the next step up in resolution to 640 by 400. The image quality is good, but edges still show quite a bit of aliasing. Medium resolution requires four render segments. High resolution is the mode which you will probably use the majority of the time for final output. At 1280 by 800, most of the jaggy, aliased edges are eliminated, and the speed is pretty good, especially if your machine's accelerated. High resolution requires 16 render segments. Print resolution at 2560 by 1800 is Lightwave's highest output level and also the slowest. This resolution is meant for output to slides, print, or film, rather than video, which doesn't have enough scan lines to do the image justice. Images rendered in print resolution stand up well against those from much more expensive 3D rendering packages. This resolution requires 50 render segments. The remaining two options offer special variations of the render resolutions above. With Overscan turned on, Lightwave will render the image all the way out to the edges of the screen rather than leaving a black border around it. This mode is essential for broadcast quality output. It also adds more rendering time by increasing the amount of picture that Lightwave must draw. When letterbox is turned on, the top and bottom of the image are clipped by black. This results in an image much like that seen in many movie commercials and tapes, providing a simulation of the aspect ratio found in a movie theater. Rendering time is decreased by approximately 30% when using letterbox. If you're using letterbox in an animation which has a black background, you won't be able to tell that it's there. Instead, it will look like objects are just vanishing for no apparent reason. One solution for this problem is to increase the background black to red, green, and blue levels of five or higher to produce contrast between the image area and the letterbox. The record panel lets you specify how Lightwave is to record the images it renders, whether that be to a video medium, such as tape or laser disc, or computer medium, such as a diskette or hard drive. If none of the options here are specified, Lightwave will just continue to render images over one another, keeping none of them. The Save Images button will produce a file requester, which expects you to specify a directory and file name prefix to save each image under. If you give Lightwave the prefix Render, for example, each frame of your animation will be saved with the pattern Render001 render 002, render 003, etc. If you were to turn this option on and render just one frame, however, change this scene and render again, the new frame will overwrite the old one. It's very important to remember to turn this option off by clicking on it again once you have finished rendering an animation, or the next thing you render is likely to erase one previously saved. These pictures are saved as Amiga Standard IFF 24-bit images at a resolution of 752 by 480. The full size save option will cause images rendered in high resolution or print res to be saved in their full size. This results in some extremely large files. Print res, for example, in full size format can take up well over 10 megabytes of storage space per frame. The full size save option is intended for use when the ultimate destination of the image is a film recorder or a desktop publishing package. The file that this option produces cannot be loaded back into Lightwave or even into toaster paint, so make sure you really need to use it if you do. 
The Save Frames option serves the same purpose as the Save Images button, but causes the pictures to be saved in NewTek's Frame Store format. This is handy in that standard images cannot be loaded directly into the toaster switcher, but frame stores can. As with Save Images, you need to specify a prefix to which LightWave will add the appropriate frame number. Once a sequence of frames have been saved, the Play Frames option can be used to display them in order one after the other. This is useful for recording them to a video medium, but you'll need to set the recording options below to allow your video recorder to keep up. Frames are played back as fast as they can be retrieved from the storage unit unless the record delay states otherwise. The frames to be played are specified by locating the directory in which they are stored, then providing only the prefix name used to save them. If you give LightWave both the prefix and frame numbers, as would happen if you just clicked on the file name and hit OK, it will not work. You can specify the frame numbers to be displayed by adjusting the first and last frame in the scene area. When the recording button is turned on, every time LightWave finishes rendering a frame, it will cue a video recorder using the information specified in the options below. This event occurs through the serial port on the back of your video toaster system. All of the options in this area may or may not apply to your particular recorder and single frame controller. Please consult the manuals for those products before using these options. The record setup is used when you wish to issue a command directly to the serial port, such as a stop command. Whatever is entered in the pop-up requester will be sent immediately after you click the OK button or hit return. If your single frame controller needs to have a frame number passed to it by the system, you will probably need to use the start position. The number you enter here would tell LightWave how many frames into the tape the animation is to begin. As LightWave generates each frame, it adds the new frame number to this one and passes it along. The record command is the information that gets sent out through the serial port once a frame is completed. The record delay setting is used to tell LightWave how long to wait after sending a record command before proceeding with the next frame. A normal setting for a VTR is 5 seconds to allow for the tape to pre-roll. If no value is specified here, you may find that LightWave has already begun creating the next frame before the current one is put on tape. This value should be specified in seconds. Some VTRs require a longer pre-roll when establishing the first edit. For those machines, you could enter a first frame delay amount in seconds. LightWave offers an excellent environment for putting together your scenes called the Layout. Layout actually produces a 3D view where you can move objects, lights, camera, change viewpoints, and much more. The Layout controls are split up into groups of their own, keeping like operations together. The upper left corner of the Layout window is titled View Mode, and that is just what it lets you select. Using the buttons in this area, you can look at your scene from any number of perspectives. The XY view mode gives you a point of view down the Z axis. This lets you look straight at the scene. When you are using this view, you will be unable to move any items along the Z axis. The XZ view mode gives you a look at your scene from the top down, or looking down the Y axis. In this mode, you will not be able to move items along the Y axis. The ZY view mode lets you look at your scene from the side, or down the X axis. This mode will not allow you to move an item along the X axis. Perspective view mode offers a completely independent viewpoint which you may place anywhere you desire. Moving the perspective point of view will not affect the finished scene in the least. It is simply here so that you can go check on a portion of your scene without having to move your camera. What you see when looking through the camera view is what you're going to get when you render the scene. The next section on the left is easily mistaken for the first set, but they are very different, and it is very important to pay close attention to which you are using. You see, while the previous set let you decide where you are looking from, this set lets you decide which type of item you are adjusting. When View is selected as the edit item, you are able to change the position of any of the View modes except Camera. For example, if my edit item is View, 
and my view mode is perspective, I'll be able to adjust my perspective view using the next set of options. When object is selected as the edit item, you can adjust the objects in your scene. The light selection from edit item gives you the ability to manipulate any lights you may have in your scene. By default, Lightwave does not show you lights in your scenes. When you are in this mode, however, your light or lights will appear. As you've probably guessed, the camera selection from edit item will allow you to adjust your camera position. Note that you don't have to be looking through the camera view mode when you adjust the camera, but you'll want to most of the time. The mouse function you choose from this next group decides exactly what your mouse will do when you move it. Since a mouse only has a limited number of trigger motions, you get to choose which type of movement is being changed. Certain of these mouse functions only appear if you are using a particular edit item type. By setting the mouse function to move, you tell Lightwave that dragging the mouse to the left or right while holding down the left mouse button will adjust position on the x-axis. Dragging with the left mouse button forward and back will adjust the Z. Finally, dragging with the right mouse button forward and back will change the Y axis. The position of the item is shown in the status window in the lower right of the layout. Keep in mind, however, that your choice in view mode may restrict your movements. In that case, simply choose another view mode. Rotate tells Lightwave that dragging left or right with the left mouse button will adjust heading, dragging forward or back with the left mouse button will adjust pitch, and right button forward and back will adjust bank. The direction of the item is displayed in the status window in the lower right corner of the layout. The size mouse function offers only two types of movement since it adjusts all three axes at the same time. Holding either mouse button and dragging left will enlarge the object, while dragging right will shrink it. The percentage of change is shown in the status window in the lower right corner of the layout. You'll only find size available when object is selected as the edit item. Stretch is the same idea as size, but can be adjusted separately on each axis. Dragging the left mouse button to the right or left adjusts the object's scale along the x-axis. Forward or back stretches along the Z, and with the right mouse button stretches along Y. Stretch only appears when using the object edit item. The zoom mouse function appears only when editing the view. Dragging either button to the left will zoom out, letting you see more of the scene. Either button to the right will zoom in for close-up work. Remember that since this only affects your view, not your camera, it will not affect your final image. Confused yet? Don't be. A few minutes of experimentation in here and you'll be moving faster than you ever imagined. But wait, there's just a little bit more. The axis control panel allows you to lock your item's position on any of the axis while you adjust another. It changes from X, Y, and Z to H, P, and B when appropriate. If, for example, you wanted to rotate an item in heading only, simply click P and B from the rotation mouse options, leaving H pressed in. Now, no matter what mouse button combination you use or where you drag, rotation will only occur in heading. An axis is locked when it appears to be sticking up. The reset button will return any value specified by edit item, mouse function, and axis controls. It will return the value of those settings chosen to their original state. If we wanted to return the heading of our last example to its default, just click Reset with only the H button pressed in. It's pretty easy to get all turned around when trying to position your perspective view. If you want to find a particular object in your view, simply go to Object Edit Item, find the name of the object you wish to see using the Selected Item field under the 3D view, then click Center. The perspective view will now have that item centered in its view. While being able to position items graphically using the 3D view is very useful, there will be times when you need your positions to be a little more precise. Numeric input provides a way for you to type in your entries instead of using the mouse. 
the numeric input fields match the selected mouse operation setting options. Note that when you are using numeric input, the axis controls are all unlocked. Lightwave places a piece of grid work in the center of each scene, which you can only see in the 3D view. The size of this grid represents the precision level of movements you make in the view. If you find that items are moving too much too fast, just reduce the grid size. Of course, if you want larger movements, raise the grid size. This grid also gives you an idea of where the ground is in your 3D environment. When you change the grid size, you also affect the amount of zoom in your view mode. If your view was zoomed way in before you lowered the grid size, it'll probably need to be zoomed out quite a bit. If you don't want this grid to be visible even in your 3D view, you can turn it off with an option in the visibility options. The visibility options allow you to decide what you do and do not see in the 3D view. When one of these options is pushed in, it will be visible. Grid hides or reveals the perspective grid in the center of the scene. Objects hides or reveals all of the objects in the scene. Note that when an object is specified as the selected item below the 3D view, it is going to be visible regardless of this setting. Lights hides or reveals the lights in your scene. Like objects, if a light is specified as the selected item, it will be visible regardless of this setting. Camera hides or reveals the camera in your scene. You'll only see the camera if you use a view mode other than camera view. If the camera is the selected item, however, it will be visible regardless of this setting. When overlay is turned on, a set of dotted lines appear in the camera view. These represent approximate borders for certain rendering items. The overlay is actually two overlays. One is a pair of lines running from side to side. This represents the letterbox rendering borders. Anything between those two lines will be visible when a letterbox image is rendered. The other overlay is a square sitting on top of those lines. This square represents the rendering area for a non-overscan image. Anything outside this box will not be seen unless the image is rendered in overscan, in which case the entire 3D view is roughly the rendering area. The right and left edges of both the view and the non-overscan box apply equally to an image rendered in letterbox. The area directly beneath the 3D view changes depending upon which of the various modes you are working in. The selected item is the one which you wish to adjust with the other options of this screen. When you are in the object's edit item mode, it will offer a list of all of the objects in your scene. When in lights, it will list lights, and so on. The arrows to the right of this field allow you to step through these lists until you locate the item you wish. The selected item will be drawn in white in the 3D view. The field to the right of this button shows the current frame number. This frame is the one shown in the 3D view above. By clicking the Go to Frame button, you can type in the frame number you wish to be displayed. Another way to move through the frames is one by one, using the arrows to the current frame number's right. Remember when we discussed keyframes and tweens? This is where you make your keyframes for motion. Simply arrange the selected item to your liking using the various tools here, then click Create Key. This brings up a requester with the words Create Key at Frame at the top and a field with the current frame number in it. If you wish to place the key on this frame, simply proceed to the next portion of the requester. If you want to place the key on a different frame number, type it in. The second part of the requester contains buttons marked Selected Item and All Items. If you choose Selected Item, the selected item only will have a keyframe created. All items would create a keyframe for each and every item in your scene at that frame. Try to use Selected Item most of the time, however, because keys where items don't need them tend to cause problems later. There are two ways to exit this window, and it is important you realize the difference. You could take the obvious route and simply click OK or Cancel, but you could also hit Return from the Frame Number field. This causes whatever the current button setting is to be accepted. Don't forget to check it before you hit Return. The Delete Key function works in exactly the same way as Create Key, with the reverse consequences. 
Clicking the Next Key button will cause the selected item's next keyframe to be displayed. Keep in mind that each and every item in your scene can have its own keyframes. Previous Key causes the selected item's previous keyframe to be displayed. The Spline Control button gives you access to the current frame's spline controls, which we discussed earlier in the tape. Note that this button will only appear when you are on a keyframe for the selected item. As mentioned in the motion control panel explanation, items may be made to move in relation to another item. When an item other than the selected item is specified in this option, the selected item's movement will be linked to those of the parent item. To disable this feature, simply set the parent to none. Set target will only appear in conjunction with the camera or lights. When a target is chosen, the selected item will make sure to always point at it, wherever it may go. This would be useful when you wish to have your camera follow a fast-moving object, for example. To turn this off, simply set the target to None. When you are building an animation, it's often useful to see it in motion before you actually record it. Lightwave allows you to produce wire previews of your animation from any view mode, a prompt will appear asking if the preview should be generated in bounding box or wire frame. Bounding box will use box outlines of each object in the scene in place of the detailed versions. This results in much faster preview generation and works well for checking general motion. Wireframe, on the other hand, will produce the preview using the true object data. The frames rendered in a preview are those between the first frame and last frame, as specified in the Scene Control Panel. As Lightwave renders a preview, you'll see the frame number placed in the lower right corner of the 3D view for each image. Once the preview has been created, use Play Preview to show it. By the way, there is no way to save a preview. Play Preview is used to display the preview created with Make Preview. If none exists, Lightwave will let you know. When playing a preview, the area beneath the 3D view provides VCR-like controls. You may view your preview forward or backward all the way through at 30 frames per second in TSC, 15 frames per second, 10 frames per second, or one at a time. When you are finished examining your preview, simply click End Playback. Now you should have a good idea of what you can do with Lightwave. Putting them to use, though, is another matter. Let's go through some tutorials and we'll see exactly how these things work together. Digital Micronics Incorporated brings the latest in floptical disk technology to your video toaster. The DMI floptical disk is a standard SCSI device that lets you back up and store a convenient 21 megabytes per diskette at less than $1 per megabyte. In addition to your toaster, the DMI Floptical Disk Drive is compatible with IBM, Mac, and Unix workstations and reads and writes to standard 720K and 1.44 megabyte floppies. So if you're tired of buying expensive hard drives, backing up on 880K floppies, and wondering how to get MS-DOS files into your toaster, then the DMI Floptical Disk Drive is the storage solution for you. DMI Floptical Disk Drives are available in both internal and external versions and come complete with everything you need to get started. This incredible new product comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee and a one-year warranty. Call now for current prices. <laughs>